We're so grateful for your presence in this place. We know you're going to come in more and more measures and more fullness throughout the day. And we praise you for what you're going to do to help these people go to a new level and experience breakthrough in their life. In your name, we pray these things. Amen. 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 You know, this conference is about stuff that's blocking your healing. Amen. I'm going to teach you about a couple of things that you can do to position yourself to move into regular victory, regular healing in your mind, your body, your emotions, your family, your friends, your business, your ministries, and every part of your life. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm going to share with you a revelation about demonic kings and how they can be blocking your healing, how they can be causing you to have mental disorders, physical illnesses, can be causing a block on your financial prosperity and your increase. And I'm going to show you why it's biblical that we need to go and get rid of them. Sometimes we need to get rid of them first before we can get a major uh, victory in our lives. I'm going to share with you the story of how I got this revelation. It came through my mother. My mom had a disease that ate her bones. In the 1980s, she was bitten by a Lyme's tick. And when that happened, a spirochete bacteria was released into her body, and then it began to consume the cartilage in her body. And she also developed a severe strain of rheumatoid arthritis. And when these two things joined together, she started losing various parts of her body. She first lost her knees, and the doctors put in artificial knees. And she actually, you know, stood up for a second there and enjoyed that a little bit of time. And that then her, her left hip got eaten so badly that they had to take it out and they put in an artificial hip on that side. And she stood up and, and actually walked then during that period of time for about six months. And at the end of six months, suddenly one day she collapsed. They took her back into the hospital. They opened her up and found out that the disease had eaten the plastic parts of the man-made hip. Ooh, that's the devil. Amen. They never put another hip back in. She remained hipless to the end on that side. You could take her leg and twist it around. We called her the boneless chicken. <laughs> her right hip got so thin from being consumed by this disease that they were going to take it out, the pelvic bone out, because the leg bone was about to break through the pelvic bone into her intestines. She lost the, the cartilage in her knuckles right here, and the little bones in her fingers fell out of her knuckles. You could actually take her fingers and twist them around. Can you imagine that, having to live like that, where your bones and your cartilage are being consistently eaten away every day for 25 years? It's excruciating agony and pain. In 2006, I had been out of prison for like three years, and I'd been praying and praying and praying for a breakthrough for mom, and nothing had came. But God, through signs, wonders, and miracles, began to direct me to go to a church that I had never heard of before in California called Bethel Church in Redding, California. How many people have heard of Bethel Church? Yes, I know. I'm the last one in the face of the planet. <laughs> I've been in prison, you know. <laughs> I was a little behind the times. But God directed me to go there, and he said, when you go to this church, I'm going to give you, and this is what he called it, the Matthew 10 anointing that drives out demons and heals the sick. So I got on planes. It was, took me three planes to, to fly to Reading, and this was a big deal because here I am, an ex-con. I'm out of prison. I haven't even been out of the state. You know, I had to get permission from my uh, probation department. I fly to this church, and when I get there, I realize why God had sent me there because it's a church known for the kingdom of heaven regularly manifesting and visiting that place. And so I got there, and sure enough, on the third day, I'm in the service, and I'm standing in the front because I, I made sure that I went early, got my seat in the front because nobody was going to get it. I was going to get mine. And if anybody moved my stuff in my seat, I could move it back because I have that kind of anointing. <laughs> and I sat there, and I got it. And, and I remember two housewives came with their children hanging off of their skirts and they laid hands on me and the power of God began to fill me up and I felt like liquid power coming down and filling up my left arm it actually felt heavy my left arm and I started walking around telling everybody what happened because of course I told everybody why I was there so they're all like oh congratulations that's awesome let me have some of that and I'm like don't touch me this is for mom <laughs> if I only would have known it would multiply as soon as I would have let it go 
So here I am, I've got this tangible evidence that I have this anointing that God sent me to go get. And so I fly home and I'm super excited. I'd had already signs and wonders telling me something great was gonna happen. Now I've got this anointing. I get home and I lay hands on mom and something happened that had never happened before. Now I had this switch. I felt like this heater turn on. It was like <laughs> going inside of me as the power was being released. And I'm laying my hands on mom and I'm praying and I'm decreeing and I'm totally believing and I'm feeling like she's just going to stand up any minute. It's going to be totally awesome. And I keep on praying and believing and nothing happened. You ever been there? So the next day, the same thing, nothing happened. Next day, the same thing, nothing happened. Finally, on the third day, my father shows up. He had spent all night in the emergency room for a prostate problem that he had for many, many years. And as I stood there in front of him, the Lord said, just go over there and lay hands on him. Don't even say anything. So I did. I walked over there and I put my hand on his head. And I just began to just believe and release this anointing that I had. And I felt the power turn on and the heat. And he began to sweat and I began to sweat. And he was healed. Amen. Amen. So we knew we had it and it worked. So I'm like, okay, great. What's the problem with mom? <laughs> so I began to go before the Lord to find out what it was that was stopping the manifestation of healing for mom. And as I talk to you about it, I want to first start by telling you a foundation about why sickness happens. There are different sources for sickness. The fall of man is one. As soon as we fell in the garden, we died and our bodies began to decay. Okay? Sickness also comes from sin. Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethsaida and later on when he met up with that man in the temple, he said, oh, I, I see you're well now. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. That indicated that sin created that man's illness. Amen? Sickness also comes from the enemy. We see the example with Satan when he covered Job from head to toe with boils. Remember that story? There are many different origins of sickness. And with mom, the Lord began to tell me that the enemy was not only one of the reasons why she was sick, but he was also a reason why her healing was being hindered. So when he told me that, he said, I want you to go and look at the story of the Matthew 10 anointing that you got when you went to Bethel. He says, and as you read it, I want you to notice the order in which Jesus talks about the anointing. Now listen, it says this, that Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave him authority. And here's the order to one, drive out evil spirits and to two, heal every disease. You see, things are in order in the Bible for a certain reason. The, one of the reasons why Jesus talks about the anointing in this order is because sometimes you must first drive out evil spirits that are causing sickness before you can then heal the disease that they created. Amen? So when I got that revelation, I was like, okay, no problem. So I started going in and rebuking every demon in the face of the planet off of mom. And nothing happened. You ever been there? Oh, you haven't? Have you ever been there? Yes. Okay. So now I go back to the Lord and said, okay, now what's up? I, I did what you said. I, I, I rebuked all the demons off of mom. And, and the Lord says, good, you're doing what I told you to do. But once again, it's about order. Now you're fighting the enemy, but you're doing it in the wrong order. You see, the demonic kingdom operates in a specific order. It operates like an army. That's why the man at the tombs told Jesus that his name was Legion, because Legion is a Roman army term. He knew he was part of an army. And in every army, there's ranks. In the United States Army, there's generals, there's colonels, there's lieutenants, there's privates. And that's the same way in the demonic army. And the Lord began to speak to me and he said, look, you can't start at the bottom of the army and try to work your way up to the top, trying to fight like a salmon upstream to get to the generals, to the top dogs. You gotta start from the top and work your way down. And that's when you're gonna start to see success when you're fighting the demonic kingdom. And when the Lord said that to me, he said, no, I want you to go. He said, I want you to look at the classic Ephesians 6, 12 scripture. And I did, I went to it in the Amplified. And as I read it to you, I want you to notice the order in which Paul talks about the ranks in the kingdom of darkness. Listen to it. It says this. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the, and here's the order, but against the despots, against the powers, and against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness. Okay, there's that order. 
It's the food chain in the demonic kingdom. And at the top of the food chain is a despot. What's a despot? I looked it up. A despot is a tyrant king. Now, no king is a king unless he has a kingdom underneath him. Well, who are the spirits in these kings' kingdoms? The next two in the list, the powers and the master spirits. I looked up the word powers in the Webster's Dictionary. You know what it means? It actually means orders of angels. That's one of the meaning of the word powers. There's the ranks. There's the ranks in the demonic army right there. Then I looked at the word master. To master just means to control. So they're the next in the order. Those are spirits that are kind of on the smaller scale. They're like the privates of the army. They're just able to control you in some way, to master you in some way. So there is the order of the demonic kingdom. It's despots or tyrant kings, and underneath them in their kingdoms are the powers or the ranks, and then the master spirits at the bottom. And when I got that revelation, the Lord spoke to me and said, if you will learn how to fight and defeat demonic kings, he said, the powers and the master spirits underneath them in their kingdoms will just submit to you. I said, oh yeah? Where's that in the Bible? He said, it's in the story of David and Goliath. So I went to the story of David and Goliath and I saw exactly what God was trying to say to me. I saw proof in 1 Samuel 17 that if we will fight the demonic army in the right order by going to the top and working our way down, then the demonic kingdom underneath these powers, these kings at the top will fall easily. I saw the story and it says that this, that the Philistines had gathered their armies for battle. And so had the Israelites. They were all lined up in battle array. So here's these armies lined up in battle array, ready to fight, but they're not fighting. Why? Because each army had a champion that was doing the fighting for them. Goliath was representing the Philistines and David is representing the Israelites. Okay, and in this story, Goliath comes up and he says something every day for 40 days to challenge Israel. And in the statement he makes, I saw it so clearly about what God was trying to say to me, that if you'll learn how to fight the demonic kingdom in the right order, if you'll go to the top and work your way down, your success and your victories are gonna come so much more faster than they ever had before. And here's what Goliath said, for every day for 40 days he came up and in verse 9, this is what he would say. He said, choose a man from among yourselves. Let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we, meaning me and my army, will submit to you. You see, the Philistine army wasn't fighting because, because Goliath was doing it for them. He was their covering. He was their protector. And what Goliath was saying was this, my army goes in the right order. And if you come and if you fight me and you can kill me, then guess what? All of us will submit to you because it's about headship. It's about order. Amen? So then that's exactly what happened because the scripture says this, that when David came to fight Goliath, that he took out a stone and he slung it and it struck the Philistine sinking into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Okay, you see there, right there, that scripture indicates that David killed Goliath with the stone. He prevailed over Goliath with the sling and the stone. But then David goes and he does something very interesting next, even though the giant's already been slayed. The scripture says that he ran over he took out Goliath's sword, and in front of the entire Philistine army, he cut off Goliath's head. Why did he do that, if the giant was already dead? Because you see, the removal of the head symbolizes the removal of headship. And what happened next? The very next verse says this, and when the Philistines saw their mighty champion was dead, they fled. They fled. The Philistines didn't rise up and say, ooh, Goliath's dead. We need to go kick some Israelite behind. No, they did exactly what Goliath said they would do. When they saw that their champion was dead, that their covering was gone, they didn't raise up and fight. They rose up and fled without a fight. Did you hear that? Jesus. That is exactly the way the demonic kingdom operates. See, Goliath is representatory of every demonic king in the demonic realm. His name in the Hebrew, it comes from a Hebrew root word, which means to exile. Do you know what to exile means? It means to separate someone from his or her country or home, either voluntarily or by force. Where does the Bible say we are citizens of? We are citizens of heaven. What's in heaven? 
everything you need. The healing that you need right now for your body, the miracle that you need for your finances, the help you need for your son and your daughter and your husband and your wife. Everything you need is in heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we have the rights to all those things. And it is the job of Goliath's demonic kings to do what their very name means, to exile you from your rights, from your citizenship in heaven, so you cannot collect on any of the provisions that are there for you. Do you understand that? Just everybody say with me, Goliath, Goliath represents, represents every demonic king. Every demonic king. See, that's their assignment, to exile you from your rights as citizens of heaven. Amen? And his armies operate just like him. When you go up and you remove the Goliaths in your life, the Philistines underneath them will fall. Hallelujah. Jesus. The way that David fought Goliath is the way that Jesus fought the enemy and won. Now listen to me. Jesus Christ came to earth as a man.